Here we are! Right! Fuck, man. I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I read Robert Anton Wilson and all this shit, and here we are, we're standing here, we're talking about this shit, and it's real. <laughs> okay, I'm pissed, and in half an hour, I'm going to come up on drugs, so watch for it. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, is there any practicing magicians in the audience? Put your hand up if we got any. Yeah, come on, bold. A few. Okay, by the time we finish this, you're all going to be practicing magicians. This shit's easy, right? I'm like you, basically, why are we here, right? Why are we here at this thing? What are we, what's this all about? And by the way, this is a Scottish accent. So, reset the filters and pretend it's Sean Connery talking to you, okay? 007. <clears throat> right. So if you can follow me, I'm, I'm just going to talk the way I talk, and fuck you if you don't understand me. <laughs> the deal is this. I've been writing this comic for the last six years, and the weird thing was, like you, like everyone here, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Why do we feel different? Why don't we fit into this world? Why do we think that they're not telling us the truth? So I went out and I read Robert Anton Wilson's books when I was 20 years old, which is 20 years ago now. And I figured, is this guy bullshitting me? He says we can talk to aliens, we can talk to people from Sirius. Is he talking crap? He said Alistair Crowley's got methods for contacting alien intelligence and for changing the world. Is he talking crap? So I did it, and no, he's not talking crap, right? And we can all do it. And this is uh, by way of trying to demolish the counterculture and replace it with something useful. We're just going to start here and see where we get to. When I started doing The Invisibles, which is a comic book for people who don't, haven't seen the thing, it's a comic book which is kind of my attempt to explain what happened to me after I'd been abducted by aliens in Kathmandu in 1994. And the only reason I was abducted by aliens in Kathmandu in 1994 is because I went to Kathmandu in 1994 to be abducted by aliens. <laughs> <laughs> and it works, right? And these fuckers, they will turn up. <laughs> and what they told me was this, and they tell everyone the same bullshit, but it's in different perspectives, it's from different nervous systems, it seems to be filtered through everyone's own view of the world, but they keep telling us the same shit. So I met these guys, I'm sitting in the roof garden of the, the Vajra Hotel in Kathmandu, and I was totally doing tons of dope, right? you know, but in my defense, I do like a quarter of dope a day, right? and I've been doing it since 1990. So I know this shit, and as you all know, everyone out there who's like, who's ahead and who knows what I'm talking about, you don't hallucinate, right? If you go to the garage, it's the fucking garage. If you go to the 7-Eleven, it's the fucking 7-Eleven. You might be stoned. You might be picking up lots of interesting little bits and pieces that you don't normally get when you're straight. But you know what's real and you know what's not real. So, as I say in my defense, man, I was loaded. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the end of a week in which I'd been loaded every single day. And I'm sitting up there in the roof garden and suddenly these fuckers arrive and they arrive en masse, and they look exactly like Terence McKenna described. <laughs> Why is that? Because <laughs> I'd just read Terence McKenna a year before. What they told me was they took me out of my body, I wasn't in my body anymore. This doesn't normally happen with hash, this happens on DMT or it happens on ketamine or something, right? I'm on hash, a tiny little bit, size of a lentil, and I start tripping and I'm out of my body. And these fuckers are there and they said, where do you want to go? The first thing I said was Alpha Centauri, which is the first thing you would say, of course. <laughs> and they took me to Alpha Centauri, and it's fucking real, it's there, there's three suns, the whole thing was moving exactly as we're told it's supposed to move astronomically. And I'm there, and I said to them, well, what the hell's going on here, <laughs> as you might? And uh, they said, we've come to tell you this stuff so that you can put it in your work and explain it to the world. Right? Why do they always say that to everyone? <laughs> Why do they always tell everyone to go out and tell the world what's going on and everyone tells us the same shit? So these things, I met them, and what they were was like silver, like those things you get in rave videos, basically silver morphing mercurial blobs of chrome that think. And they took me to the fifth dimension. <laughs> and the fifth dimension is outside space and time, and they explained to me what time is all about. The universe we live in, is designed to grow larvae, right? <laughs> believe it, don't you? I don't have to believe it, I'm just setting the story here. <clears throat> they explained to me that 
Beyond space and time, we have our actual selves. These things that we're experiencing right now are sections through time. Everyone in here is a section through time. But in actual fact, you're not experiencing your real body. What is your real body? Your real body is a process that starts when you're born and it moves forward until you die. That is you. Seen from outside, that's what you look like. You look like a gigantic centipede spread around all the little things that you always do, up and down through your house, up the stairs, down to the store, back. And it's a centipede. It's us, right? It starts as a little baby and it comes out your mother's womb and it gets bigger. And that is the process in time. Like I say, we're experiencing sections now, so we don't spend a lot of time thinking about this. But think of ourselves as processes through time, which is what we actually are. We all know we were 12. We all know we were 10 years old. Where is that? Point to it. Show me that you at 10 years old, and yet you were there. So these things said to me, <clears throat> this is what's going on. We use time to grow larvae because outside space and time you can't grow anything because it's timeless nothing grows what you want to do if you want to make one of these higher dimensional beings who's actually us already is you grow it in time so you make a universe <laughs> and how you make a universe is you plug a little part of yourself into the information world that they live in which is what i seem to be experiencing is a, a sea of pure information and they exist in that, but there is no time. Time is part of that, but this is the fifth dimension. It's time, space, bread, depth, plus. <coughs> and they said to me, the universe you live in, the world you're living on, is a larvae. Every single one of us here is the same thing. There's no distinction. All we do, we don't understand what we are. And they explained to me, if you've got a two-dimensional field, say, flat plane, you stick your hand through it, there's one hand there, but if you stick your hand through a two-dimensional plane and there's two-dimensional entities who live on there, they will see four circles, right? Four distinct, completely different circles, but no, it's the one hand. Every one of us in here is the same fucker. <laughs> We're all the same thing, according to these weirdos. And what we are is intersected. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad someone agrees. <coughs> what we are is intersections through 4D space-time. So, yeah, I look like this, I stop here. No, I don't stop here. I've been here for, what, five minutes now? Where was that guy who was here five minutes ago? <laughs> right, where is he? Point to him. But he was existed, you all saw him. I saw you five minutes ago. Where is that guy? <laughs> so this led me, in, obviously, up some very strange alleyways. And, uh... These things explain to me that, as I say, the universe is some kind of larval entity. What it does is it proceeds through a st stages of development. Now, if you think about a fetus in the womb, and there's a famous phrase that says, uh, what is it, phylogeny recapitulates, you know, evolution or whatever the fuck it is. You know, <laughs> forget the good bits. <laughs> but <clears throat> there's the idea that if you've got a fetus, it starts off, it goes through every single thing, it starts as a unicellular entity, it splits, it becomes a, a lizard, it becomes a mammal, eventually it becomes a human. And they said to me, the culture you're living in is, understand it this way, phylogeny recapitulates history. So what we're actually watching is this thing coming towards self-awareness and coherence in the same way that a fetus does. We haven't even been born yet. There is no adult on this planet. There's not one adult on this planet, which explains a lot. <laughs> and it explains why we let fuckers like Bill Clinton bomb the Kosovans. It explains why I let Tony Blair put cameras in the streets. <sighs> Punk rock, dude. <clears throat> this is a Donna Karan suit. Fuck it. So leading on from these ridiculous, where, where do you go from that? <laughs> I was told this stuff and I come out, and I'm just this little kid from Govan in Glasgow, which is a real dodgy area. And I didn't go to university, I left school at 18, but suddenly I found out that if you do these things that you're told by Alistair Crowley, by Wilson, by all these people we read and all these people we've been consuming, but we don't do it, if you actually do what they say, things happen. Things occur exactly as it's described, and we can all do it. 
So I decided to put this to use in the comic book that I was doing, this thing called The Invisibles. And the idea was to kind of get all this down on paper and somehow look at it, not to accept it as reality, to accept it as purely this is part of human experience. It's a part of human experience that has been described to us for thousands and thousands of years, but for the last 200 has been hidden and made occult for some reason that I don't understand, but seems to have to do with the Industrial Revolution and corporate culture. <clears throat> so these things happen. Magic works. And when I started doing the comic, I found that you could actually make magic happen by writing things and changing the operating system of the universe. It works, and I'm here to tell you to try it when you go home tonight, because it fucking works. And what happens if we all do it, everyone in this room, decides to take control of reality. I'm talking about reality. I'm talking about quantum physics. I'm talking about taking control of things from the quantum level up, from the molecular level up, and it works. This magic works. So I'll tell you something you can do while I'm here. One of the best techniques and one of the easiest techniques to prove that this thing works is to practice sigil magic. The technique is simple. Have a desire tonight. Go home and do this. Don't listen to this shit. Don't listen to my bullshit and go home and think, yeah, we are the fucking counterculture. <laughs> do it. Do it and we will change the world. Right? <clears throat> because I did it. I didn't trust those guys. I didn't trust Wilson. I didn't trust those people who told me we could do this stuff. And I'm here to tell you it works. And you can do it. We can all do it. Number one, first thing you do, write down a desire. Make it something easy that is likely to happen, something possible, rather than say, you know, I'm going to be king of the moon, which, <laughs> which you may want to be, as we all do, but <laughs> it's kind of hard to be king of the moon, you're going to have to get a rocket and go up there. So pick something easy. If you want to sigilize for a lottery win, make sure you buy a ticket or else it won't work. So these are the conditions within the material universe that we live in. What I think is we're actually dealing with is some, as I say, some kind of operating system that can be hacked using words. And words seem to be the binding agent for this thing, whatever it is. So I wrote this comic book, and as I wrote it, it became true. Things I would make the characters do became true. The main character was, uh, I gave him a bald head and a leather jacket because I thought people would like me when they read the comic. And <laughs> bald heads were really uncool back in 1992. <clears throat> and it worked. I found that if... Uh, if I put the character through a situation where he was being tortured, where his lungs had burst and he was being held in captivity and subjected to all these awful things, three months later I'm in hospital, two burst lungs, <laughs> dying of blood poisoning and facing exactly the same shamanic trial that I put my character through. So once I figured out that, I thought, well, the best thing to do is give this guy an easy time in the future. <laughs> so as a result of this, I just split up with my girlfriend and. Uh, I said, OK, I want a new one, and I want it to look exactly like this chick in the comic, because she's cool. You know? so, so I did a sigil. A month later, the girl turns up. Then another one, then another one, then another one, then another one. All aspects of this character, and I realized, oh, fuck, this is insane. Because it works, and I've done something ridiculous, because now I'm dealing with all these women who look like the character, but I don't get on with, or I can't talk to, or I can't deal with. And I began to realize a little bit about how this stuff works. So beyond that, I decided I won't use, just use it to get laid, because it seems pretty, <laughs> pretty low-grade kind of way of dealing with magic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but man, it works, believe me. <laughs> and I thought, how much could you affect reality by writing a comic that mimicked reality but pushed it in weird directions? So around about 1997, I decided I would really seriously turn the thing into a super sigil. And it was based on the idea of, uh, if you look at cave art, the first art was done, the first writing was done basically as art. And if someone wanted to make something happen, like if you were in the, if you were some like fucked up caveman in a cave somewhere moaning about the, your dinner, what do you do? You draw a bison on the wall, stick some spears in it, go out and the bison dies filled with spears. And it's, hey man, <laughs> we can make this happen. Slowly those, things become letters, they become words, they become reduced to abstractions, complexes of meaning. And you can take that basic idea 
And as we've seen, people like Austin Osmond Spear, the magician from the early part of the century, or Crowley, or the Chaos magicians from the 80s, who were a big inspiration on me, they used this stuff. And what you can do is this, like I say, try this at home. Write down a desire. Quite simple, say, it is my desire that uh, you know, my cat wins the Olympics. <laughs> Take out all the vowels. Right, write this down for fuck's sake and do it. Don't just listen, do it, right. Take out the vowels and you'll be left with a string of consonants. Take out the repeated consonants and you'll be left with a string of consonants that have no repeats in it, you know, whatever, X, Y, A, D, whatever. Turn that thing into a little image. Take the D, draw a big D, then you've got a T, draw a T under it and keep reducing it down until it looks magical. And there are no rules for this thing. Do it until it looks magical. At that point, you know, you have a sigil. The sigil will work. You can project desire into reality and change reality. It works. <laughs> <coughs> Those must be the people who have done it. <clears throat> so please, I mean, write this down, go home and do it and check it, verify the results because scientific procedure, I was reading this thing in New Scientist this week and they said the difference between bad science and good science is that scientific procedure has three criteria. And the criteria are that you can verify results, you can talk to other people who've done the thing and make sure, you know, that it works out. You can duplicate results and also some other thing I'm forgetting. <laughs> but yeah, two things is fucking good, isn't it? Two things. <clears throat> this is verifiable. People have been telling us about this for thousands of years. You know, the Tibetans have been telling us about this. The Mesopotamians have been telling us about this. And why has it been made occult? Because Coca-Cola have got the secret. These people know what we're talking about here because what you do is you create a sigil. Coca-Cola is a sigil. The McDonald's M is a sigil. These people are basically turning the world into themselves using sigils. And if we don't reverse that process and turn the world into us using sigils, we're going to be living in fucking McDonald's. <laughs> right, but McDonald's have no more power than us, apart from the fact, like, as Doug said earlier, they got some money. Fuck it, who cares? You know, at the top levels of this stuff, no one's using money anyway. Do you think Rupert Murdoch or the Queen or Bill Clinton or any of these fuckers use money? Of course they don't. They've realised that the money is the only useful to sell to the middle classes and the people in the middle who make things happen and make things run. So we've been sold a fiction. There's no such thing as money. Ignore it. At the higher levels, there is... No. Yeah! yeah hey! There is no money, these fuckers don't use money. If Rupert Murdoch wants a Rolls Royce, they give him one, because he's Rupert Murdoch. And if they see him in a Rolls Royce, it means you get some status from it. So you've got to understand, these people in the higher levels are operating in a hierarchy of exchange and barter. On the lower levels, like in Glasgow, where I live, which is the poorest city in Europe, people are living on a hierarchy of exchange that's quite different. They steal shit, and they sell it back, and they have their own little money, and they have this complete black market economy. There's only us in the middle who think money's worth any fucking thing and we chase it until we drop. So forget it. <laughs> Where was I? And the other thing is also I hate talking at people. So if anybody wants to join in, just please, you know, put your hand up because I fucking hate just talking at people. <clears throat> so having figured these weird things out, having thought about this and having been through this experience, which is exactly the experience I was promised by Wilson, McKenna, Philip K. Dick, everyone. They promised us this thing, and it works. You can get the experiences. Do what they told you to do, and it will happen. I promise you, you will meet aliens. They will talk to you. The Golden Dawn called this the conversation of the Holy Guardian Angels. Knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angels, sorry. So it's been around for a while. It's accessible to everyone. Magic is accessible to everyone. The means of altering reality is accessible to everyone. And when everyone starts doing it, we're going to get to see desire on manifest on a gigantic scale. Everyone's desire. What happens when everyone's desire becomes manifest? <laughs> Does the universe have to split up into a billion to accommodate it? Do we all have to suddenly understand that we're all in the same place and we can all share each other's desires? I don't know. I'm just here to talk about this stuff. <clears throat> so beyond that, beyond the, the alien abduction experience, I was working on the comic and I began to think about it seriously. I'd set up the comic to try and explore some of the problems we were dealing with. 
which are, as Doug pointed out earlier, problems of duality, us and them, good versus evil, this versus that. And as I worked my way through the comic, I began to realize some interesting things. I'll share them with you. These might not be true. They're useful little thoughts. They might be, you might be able to spin them, do something with them. <clears throat> but really, I'm just up here as someone who has read the same shit you've all read, put it into practice, and found that it works. So here's my version of what happens. Doing the comic, I set up these characters. The whole thing was set up as an adventure story where there's some bad guys who live in another dimension who want to enslave us all, and there's some good guys who live in another dimension who want us all to have a good time. In the middle, there is us. And we are trying to obviously have a good time. Everybody wants to have a good time. You know, Hitler wanted to have a good time. <laughs> and uh, we all want to have a good time. So we've got to understand that as a starter. The more I set up these dualities, the more I set these people against the opposition, the more it began to seem like a complete crock. And we'd been sold this nonsense of opposition. And I began to find, the closer I got to the end of the series, that the whole opposition element element of it was the least meaningful, least important part of it, and that we've actually been deluding ourselves in a lot of ways. Beyond that, I find that we've been deluding ourselves in the worst way of all, by believing in the individual. Right. Stay with me on this. <clears throat> Kafka, Orwell, Patrick McGowan and the prisoner, everyone told us the individual was the most important thing we could be. Everyone is fucking quirky these days. Every shit in the window of MTV is quirky. Everyone's cool. Everyone's smart. It's not true. <clears throat> what if the individual was the fake? What if the individual's the crock and we've actually been sold that by them, by the man, the establishment, whatever you want? Because what occurred to me is that when you talk about the individual, and you deal with the individual, you find that the end of the individual is neurosis. To be individual means that there is self and not self. Okay? So where I stop, the boundaries of me, right, there's this physical body here, the boundaries of me that stretch out, things I believe in, things that, I'm sure we'd all be friends if we talk, but would we be friends with Newt Gingrich? No. But that's the point. I stop when Newt Gingrich starts. Why is that? Why did I stop there? Why does he define my self-sense and I can't absorb him? Why do these fuckers, why does the Skull and Bones Society of the CIA, why do the 33rd degree Masons, why are they different from us? They're not. They want to explain things. They want an answer. They found an answer that seems to suit them, which seems kind of uncool and cruel to me because it involves exploiting other people, but they're looking for an answer. We're all looking for the same thing. Why are we here. Why are we here? What are you doing here today? What do you expect? What do you expect to take home with you? Can anyone answer? <laughs> There's some one person tell me what you expect to take home from me from this. Come on, put your hand up. Yeah? Exactly. Right, because that is all we have. And this is all I can offer you is the experience of having done this shit, tested it, put it in the crucible to see what happens and it works. So I began to think more and more about the individual, and I looked into what that actually meant. And what it was was a structure that was pretty much created, the ego structure was created out of uh, what Julian Jaynes calls the bicameral mind becoming one mind. And apparently, according to him, he says that back in the old days of the, the Greeks and the earliest writing in the world, People didn't have self-consciousness in the same way that we have. They didn't have egos. They didn't understand themselves as I in the same way we did because the corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres of the brain wasn't connected. So if you heard a voice, that voice was God. And Homer and all those guys have got plenty of examples of people hearing the voice of God and acting on it. Alexander constantly acted on the voice of God. Julian Jaynes suggests that it wasn't the voice of God, it was the voice of the left hemisphere of the brain communicating with the right hemisphere of the brain, interpreted as a God. So, okay, now we've got the two things joined together. We've got this beautiful bridge in the middle that links the two. But we still have the ego structure, which was then created when those things linked, because suddenly we link, oh, fuck, 
I am I, I am that I am. This is my God, my God is this, I am separate, I am one. We made this idea that we're somehow separated from nature. No, I'm not bullshit. <laughs> Was a, a, again, I read New Scientist last month, right? New Scientist last month, they're talking about nature, we must control nature, we must do this. How do we deal with our relationship to nature? We are fucking nature! There's nothing on this planet that is not nature. Power stations are nature. You know, like, atom bombs are nature, because nature made us to make those things. Either you trust nature, or you don't trust nature, and I trust nature, okay? <clears throat> so we have to assume, what is nature getting at here? If we ignore this crap that we're somehow isolated from nature, that we somehow have to tame nature, of course, and nature knows exactly what it's doing. The planet is not in danger. We are. The planet will survive. The planet's been through like ammonia atmospheres and impossible to live on and everything dead, and it gets its way back out of that. We're in danger. Or so we think, because our hubris tells us that we are in danger. Our hubris tells us that we're about to destroy the world. We're going to wreck the planet. We'll fuck the atmosphere. No, we'll fuck our atmosphere. You know, some trilobites will come up and they'll be able to live in anything we create. So that is not the problem. The problem is, we're standing here at the 21st century stuck with individuality because we believed in it so much. It seems so important that we should all be distinct. What happens if we stop being distinct? And what happens if we think about individuality as something that was actually just scaffolding for where we are now? So if you create a skyscraper, you put up your scaffolding, you build the building, and what's happened here is that we've overlooked the building and focused on the scaffolding. You know, why haven't we taken the scaffolding down? Let's do it today. Take the scaffolding down. Because the individual is a way to get us to this point. And what I really think, and basically why I'm here, is to try and punt this notion. <clears throat> after doing this comic book for six years, after thinking about this stuff for six years, after proving that it works for six years, I'm left with this notion. We've been fooled. And we fooled ourselves and we continue to fool ourselves. And like Doug said, there is no us and no them, there's just us. And somehow we're trying to make this thing work. And it does work. Say for instance, most of us here probably are pretty counterculture types. We've had some, you know, we like our drugs, we like this and that, we like breaking a few rules. But we don't like the police in general. You know, who here loves the police? Hands up. Nice one. Because <laughs> I'm going to teach you to love the police. <laughs> why do we hate the police? If we want to change things, why not the, everyone in here, let's go down to the local precinct and join up. Are we going to do it? Who's going to, who's going to do it with me? Because I'm not going to do it. <laughs> right, and why? Why are we not doing that? Right, so, we hate, so we're hating these guys who've taken on this thing. We've chosen biggest lunkheads in society to protect ourselves from the fuckers in Rikers Island. Because we are scared of them. You know, we are scared of them. We are middle class, libertarian liberals who are shit scared of being raped in prison. <laughs> so we create the police and we get the lunkheads who, who will obey what we do, tell them to do. They'll actually obey us. Those fuckers will do what we tell them. And we say to them, protect us from those real fuckers. Those bikers and those black guys and all those awful guys who are going to come and fuck us up and kill us and steal all our stuff. We put the police there. <laughs> we put them there. And we don't want to go there because we're smart people. We're cool people. We don't want to go and hit anyone. We don't want to go and enforce the law because we don't really believe in it. But we know some poor bastard has to enforce it. Why do we hate those guys? Because we put them there. What is that hate? Why do we hate ourselves for creating this society? Why are so many people in America obsessed with Marilyn Manson? Corpses, dead people, misery, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy's a fucking prick. You know, he killed a few people and he draws some shitty paintings. What's that? Why is that? And why should we be engaged with that? And yet that has become, what, apocalypse culture. <laughs> Where do we go from here that isn't that? Where do we go that isn't playing with our own shite? The answer. 
back to the individual. If the individual doesn't work, if Patrick McGoon was wrong and number six was wrong to stand in that beach screaming, I am not a number, I am a free man, what do we have left? Because ultimately the, the guy who's not a number and not a free man experiences neurosis the further he goes down that path. I'm sure there's a bunch of people in here like me who eventually, you've worked your way through the stuff, you've read the books, you've done this shit, you've taken the drugs, you've been there, you've seen it, you've experienced enlightenment in little bits. You know it's out there, you know this stuff is true, the consensus doesn't explain our lives. But, what does? <laughs> Imagine getting rid of the individual. Imagine getting rid of that scaffolding. What do we have left? And here's what I'm about to offer. The more I looked into it, the more I began to see that we have these mutants living among us right now. The people from the 21st century, from the end of the 21st century are here. But there is no context for them. In the same way that if you, you, know, if you lived in Tunguska 200 years ago, and you were a, an epileptic, you would be a shaman. There was a context for you. In this society, you're an epileptic. It's quite simple, it's a disease. Nothing you say is of any worth because it's pathology. If, on the other hand, you look at these people who are out there, who are the mutants, and what do they call it? Multiple personality disorder. This is what lies beyond the personality. This is what lies beyond the I, the bullshit, because it, if you take I to the limit, and like I say, I'm sure a lot of us here have done this, it becomes, all that happens is self questions self. Endlessly, repetitively, am I doing this right? Is this the right way? Should I think about these people like this? Should I approach them this way? Should I involve them this way? Self question self, endlessly. It reaches a peak, it goes nowhere. On the national scale, that same thing, self questions self, self encounters not self equals borders. War, destruction, that's where it goes. That thing end, it ends in disaster, it ends in neurosis on the personal level and it ends in war on the national level. So I began to think, what could we replace that with? And I was looking at these poor MPD fuckers and I realised they just don't have a context. What would happen if we decided to abandon the personality and replace it with a multiple personality complex? Because as we all know, everyone in here, I'm sure, I mean, I feel as if I can say this for certain, knowing human beings as they are, sometimes you do things that you don't want to do. Sometimes you do things that are contradictory to what you think. Sometimes you fuck yourself up. Why? Because there's not one person in here, there's hundreds. And if you start giving them names, and if you start shuffling them about, and you start playing with them, you become a bigger human being because you've no longer allowed yourself to stop at your boundaries. Imagine the personality as, well, let's, do, let's choose windows, even though it's a contentious one. Imagine the personality as windows. Instead of the personality, there's so many people, I'm sure you've met them, you talk to them and say, no, this is the way I am, I've worked on this, this is me, and I won't change. And you just have to work with that, you know, this is me, this is important, this is what I've come to, and this is what I've made of myself. Bullshit. They're trapped, they don't go anywhere, they're stuck there. What if those same people were then given Personality 2000, which is an upgrade <laughs> and an add-on? And here's a bit to your personality that likes hip-hop. Here's a bit to your personality that likes ballet. <laughs> and because we've all got them, and because we've got the fucker, we've got the serial killer inside, we've got the wonderful new age bastard, we've got... Whatever we like, we've got James Bond in there, you know, we've got Pussy Galore in there, they're all there. So what I'm suggesting is that we start working with it. Abandon the personality, abandon the individual, abandon the I because it's a lie and it has held us down. It's been like a weight around our necks. It was useful for the last 2,000 years of history because it created this out of the chaos that was. And this is more coherent, more useful, more meaningful. It has its problems, everything does, every system has, but we're getting better. And I think what we should do is walk away from the crap of the 21st century and start thinking about what we've been experiencing. My feeling about the 21st century is, and about World War II and about Auschwitz and all that stuff, is that we had to go through it. We had to do it. That was humanity's dark night of the soul and it will never, ever happen again. But it had to happen. 
Every single nightmare image, every image of hell that we have in our minds happened. Everything you can think of happened. People were flayed, brutalized, gassed, tortured, cut into pieces, turned into pigs. Everything you can imagine happened. The world was a wasteland. There were cities completely annihilated. We went through it. Why did we do that? Stanislav Grof has a conception of the perinatal matrices, which was one of the big influences on the film The Matrix, so you might recognize some of this. He says that things that happen to us around birth are really profound and they have all kinds of weird effects. They affect society, they affect the self, they affect everything, they have reverberations. And he claims that there are several states that he calls basic perinatal matrices. The first state is oceanic bliss, which we're all familiar with, I'm sure. <laughs> oceanic fucking bliss, man. <clears throat> And that is the state of the baby in the womb, untouched. It's, everything is provided for, everything is there, everything you need will turn up out of the blue. Basic perinatal matrix two is a different thing. It's when the womb starts to turn a little toxic and begins to suggest that we're about to be expelled. And, you know, we don't remember this stuff. What happened? And what was the feeling of that fetus in there who suddenly thinks my entire universe has been overturned, I'm about to be shit out? He doesn't even know where he's going. What the fuck? What the fuck's this? I was happy there. You know, it was cool. I was getting everything I wanted. And so on through to BPM4, which is this kind of a release from tension, which is the birth process. So I'm beginning to think that, whoa, as a society, and returning to the idea of uh, ontogeny as history, or phylogeny as history, whatever the fuck the word is, uh, what we're looking at now is humanity's process through Grophian matrices. And World War II is actually a Stanislav Grof basic perinatal, perinatal matrix three experience. Every image he talks about, death camps, control, you know, the idea of babies trapped in tubes, you know, you'll recognize all this from the matrix, as I say. Oil, mechanism, machines that hate us, destructive technology, it all happened. What if this little baby that is the universe, this little larvae that's approaching culmination, has had to go through these stages? Because everything does. If you want to get rid of war, how do you get rid of war? Inoculate yourself against war by having the worst fucking war you've ever had in your life. And everything after that's just an aftershock. There's nothing, we've done nothing worse than what we did in those few years. Humanity has never come close to doing anything like it. We've tried, a few lunatics have tried. Nothing on that scale. So what if we choose to imagine that humanity has passed through that stage? We've reached the 21st century and we're now reaching basic perinatal matrix four, which is victory after war, which is the struggle is over, which is we're all here, what do we do next? There was no apocalypse, there was no Christ, there was no rapture, there is nothing, all this stuff is shit. There is only us, and we've still got another thousand years, and maybe another thousand beyond that, and maybe another 20,000 beyond that. What are we going to do? Who are we? Are we going to stick to these personalities, these bounded territorial things? Are we going to expand ourselves, make ourselves bigger, so that if you happen to like world music and I don't, I can tap into your love of world music and experience it, and it means something. So all I'm suggesting here is that we all take up magic, because basically it works. We can change the world. It's quite simple. The technology's there. The Buddhists have been telling us it. As I say, the people have been telling us this for so long, and in the last 200 years, it's been driven underground, and we've forgotten, and people like us are here today to try and recover something of that. And the way to recover it is to do it. Do the techniques. Go and buy an Alistair Crowley book. Buy one with Phil Hein or Peter Carroll that's more up to date, and you don't have to bother with that 18th century fucking language of that guy. <clears throat> but do the shit and you will find it works. And we stand here now. This is the counterculture. We are the counterculture. This is like this shit. I went to something like this in 1987. There was Robert Anton Wilson and the whole deal. And I remember sitting in the audience thinking, fuck, rave is dead. <laughs> because it was that kind of thing. So that, that version of it's dead. The hippie version of it is dead. We stand here and we're looking ahead. What are we going to do? Abandon the personalities, what I suggest. Get rid of the sense of self. Get rid of the sense of I and make yourself something bigger. 
Imagine that every time you want to learn something new is a new computer program. You can buy the operating system, the update. You can learn to fly a plane in seven days according to neuro linguistic programming. So why not? Let's do it. Do we want to change things? Or are we just sitting here talking? No answer. <laughs> are we talking at all? Do we want to change things? Yeah, right, that's why we're fucking here, man. <laughs> that is why we're here. So what are we going to do? If you want to change things, the first thing you have to change is yourself. Because if you don't change yourself, you will t take on the world as if it's yourself and fuck up. You will really fuck up. Because if you don't understand your own dark side, if you don't understand your own weird, shitty side, if you don't understand the fact that there's someone in there who will kill your mother, if need be, if you can't take that on, if you can't take that on board and realise that Charles Manson and me and you are not much different, that John Wayne Gacy and me and you are not much different, except that he did it. <laughs> that, you know, there's those days where I'm going to kill that motherfucker. But we don't do it. But it's in us, and it's there. And so much of this is denial that we have no dark side. You know, the hippies and the, those lovely people in the rave era who were on ecstasy, they tried to pretend we have no dark side. And what happened was they get fucked up by their own dark side, <laughs> as will always happen. So let's kiss our dark side. Let's fuck our dark side. Let's get him down there where he belongs. <laughs> and he can tell us stuff. You know, that thing's useful. But above all, let us become plex creatures, complex, superplex, able to take on new personality traits, able to take on new ideas, able to adapt, able to extend our boundaries into what was previously the enemy territory, until the point where we become what we once called our enemy and they are us, and there is no distinction. Mad cow disease, or BSE, or CJD, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. It's very interesting. It's, because it's hitting the headlines. People are interested in these new 21st century fucked up diseases that are going to wipe us all out, apparently. This is a disease... I've been studying this because <laughs> it seems like a really good metaphor to use. CJD is a disease that attacks the brain and central nervous system and utterly demolishes them. Completely, you're fucked. You will slide down a ramp like a stupid cow. And you will, you know, you'll fall on the concrete, you won't be able to walk, your brain will turn to sponge, it will be eaten to bits. You know that CJD does that without the immune system noticing? The immune system can't detect CJD. By the time you're slipping down the ramp like the cow, it's all over. The immune system suddenly says, oh fuck, we're in trouble. <laughs> Too late, mate. So what happens if we act like CJD and BSE? What if we colonise the culture? What if we give it something it can't swallow? And this is a little bit like what Doug was saying earlier. We go in there, they want us, they're desperate for us because they think we know this shit, we know something they don't know, we're attached, we're connected in some way that they don't, they, whoever, they, you know, these poor bastards. They're looking at us, it's like, I've got a leather jacket, I know something. You know? <laughs> but that's what they think. And what I think has actually happened here the culture's getting weirder and weirder. Back home in Britain, Tony Blair is putting up cameras on every street corner, and he's talking about putting cameras in people's homes. He's got rid of trial by jury. I mean, this is like fascist Britain, 1999, you know? But the more he does this, the weirder things get. The more cameras you put up, the more people will start to act like movie stars. <laughs> the more people start to act like movie stars, the weirder things get. <laughs> And then the more cameras they put up to try and deal with it, and the weirder it gets. <laughs> so let them bring the camera, and I'll fucking act the shit out of these bastards. <laughs> Let's have the cameras. Let's have cameras everywhere, and we'll show them what we can do. <laughs> and they'll be watching it and going, man, that guy's getting fucked. I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> and they want in. They want in in this. So it's like Doug said, invite them in. Let's take them in. Let's be like the diseased prion that destroys its host in CJD. Let's go in there and give them something they cannot digest, something they cannot process, something so toxic, so dangerous, so powerful that it will breed and destroy them utterly. <laughs> Not destroy them, turn them into us, because that's all we want. We want everybody to, want everybody to cool. We don't want to go out there and think, that guy's going to kill me. That guy hates me. That guy's got some fucking weird agenda. 
Don't we just want to talk and look, let it all go now and just say, hey, I'm interested in you. What have you got to tell me? That's what it's all about, isn't it? We communicate, we join up, we make networks, we make things happen. And there are some people in the world who don't want to do that. So let us infect them. Infect them to the point where they become us, where there's nothing left in this world but us. And then some kid will come up and fuck that as well. And that'll be, that'll be exactly what we need at the time. And that's me finished, so thank you very much. <laughs>